Pratpal, it's fabulous to see you. Thanks for allowing me to have this conversation with you. Uh, and I should explain to everyone that this is like 47 years after we were at school together and we've actually met up <laughs> and we're in Pratpal's house trying to socially distance. Um, but uh, we're going to have a conversation really to explore uh, <clears throat> leadership, but from your perspective as being someone who spent a whole lifetime in education. And, and maybe just so I can catch up, tell me just a little bit about what you've been, what you've been doing for at least the last 25 years. Because <laughs> I know you've, you've, done, you've done some work in South Africa or you've been on a British Council uh, visit there. You've done some work for the government in London or in the Minister of the Department of Education, but also at Drayton uh, School as well. So, um, Pratpal. Tell us how you see it. Well, Matthew, it's been just a joy to catch up. It's been an incredibly long time and, you know, given we spent so much time together at school and had so much fun, so many memories to share, which have been reawakened. It's been uh, terrific, actually. Um, so after Highgate, after studying, <clears throat> yep. I went into the state sector mm -hmm. uh, in 1978 yep. and teaching practice. I uh, then worked at the sixth biggest comprehensive school in England, which wow. was on three different sites. Gosh. Grammar school, yep. girls' secondary modern, boys' secondary modern, <clears throat> combined to form this giant comprehensive school. And I loved it. It was the sort of early days of comprehensive education, um, and I learned so much. There was an esprit de corps in the school. It's a very tough environment. And uh, there I was teaching chemistry. Yep. And we made great progress, and chemistry became a very popular subject for the students. Um, I then became head of science uh, in Hampshire after being head of chemistry at Felton. Yeah. And then I think my big break was when I became a deputy head at, in Hounslow with the great William Atkinson, who taught me so much. So I was five right. years one of his deputies, and that was just probably the best training you know I could possibly have had. Yeah. Uh, and he did things and gave you the confidence to do things um, that in a different school environment, I may not have the opportunity to go ahead with some of the projects if it wasn't him being the head. Right, okay. I think that was, for me, the biggest difference. The, it wasn't risk-taking, but the ambition that... William Atkinson had was phenomenal. And it chimed with me. Yeah. It really chimed with me to get students who were in the state system to have that sort of ambition is true. Yeah. And then um, he said to me, uh, you need to be ahead. And I was quite scared because I wasn't <laughs> the guts ready. Yeah. And he basically sent me off to play. And that's the kind of man he was. Yeah. He, you know, he pushed people forward as well. You know, he didn't want to hang on to you people he wanted them to do well in their own lives too it's the greatness of the man isn't it yeah and that's when i went to drayton man in uh, september 1994 and i did 25 and a half 76 terms gosh so you went you so you were deputy head mm -hmm. and then you went straight into headship. headship in a pretty large school pretty large school yeah and then after about 10 years <clears throat> they asked me to get involved with london challenge yeah. And I went on to be a joint director of the leadership strand. And um, that was very enjoyable, different, doing a different sort of work. So what did that involve? So, so it was a London challenge. Mm -hmm. So what did that what did that involve you in? Uh, quite a bit of travelling because uh, I was still running Great Manor. Yeah. And then I was doing one and then two days a week, uh, working for, as under the National College of School Leadership. Yeah. So we and were funded by them. Yeah. Uh, but funded in a complicated way. Yeah. And it was really to build capacity in London schools, 411 secondary schools, because London at that point, I believe, was the lowest achieving city in the UK, Gosh. just based on the single measure of GCSE results, yeah. A to C percentages. Right. Now, whether you agree with that measure or not, that was the measure that we yeah. used. Um, and it was fascinating because what we discovered was of the 411 secondary schools, the 55 lowest achieving schools were clustered in just simply five local authorities out of 32. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, with the limited capacity we had, we couldn't do it on our own. So the model was to get successful head teachers 
who weren't just successful, but would be good coaches and good mentors. Right. Work alongside heads who are in these schools who might leave because they're tired out or yeah. not getting enough support and help them improve their schools and guide them through the whole business of how local authorities work. And a lot of the local authorities have been converted into um, different organizations by the government of the time, which is Labour. Yeah. So local authorities had their powers taken away and you organization taking it. So that was, that was quite a fluid situation, you know. Yeah. Um, and it was very enjoyable getting heads together, talking about leadership in schools. And then from that, um, I worked on a thing called MPQH Plus, which I worked with another secondary head <clears throat> and a primary head. And that was to do with all the things MPQH on its own, I didn't feel was covering. And that was yeah. governance, leadership, human resources, stuff like that. And we got that, to roll that out, across the whole of London, Isle of Wight, uh, bits of the Midlands, Buckinghamshire. Gosh. And that was really, I love that actually, because that was working with deputy head teachers yep. and talking about what is headship really like. Right, <laughs> yes. Yeah. The stuff you don't read in a book. Yeah. <laughs> and I really enjoyed that. There were residential courses and it was great working with the team uh, that we had, the other secondary head, the, the primary heads as well. So we covered the full range. Yeah. And right across all the local authorities in London, I'd say the Isle of Wight, Buckinghamshire, and so on. And, and what did you discover about the leadership in these schools? First thing is, uh, people have such a mixed experience. Yep. So, for example, <clears throat> and I had a feeling about this, that if you talk about finance to a deputy head, quite often they say, well, my head does all of that. Yep. If you talk about governance to a deputy head, they said, oh, the head does all of that. In some schools, they said, oh, the head involves me in that. Right. And so on. And so depending on where you're caught up in your career path, yeah. you may or may not get the best exposure in terms of equipping you for the top job. Right. In, yeah. in, in school terms. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so in the three days that we had, we tried to cover those sort of key aspects of leadership, governance, finance, HR, and alongside that have the conversations that you need to have over dinner and so on, and yeah. explore the questions that people have. Of course, the variety of questions was enormous, yeah. you know, depending on circumstances. And of course, giving people the confidence to ask the questions don't feel silly. Yeah. You know, that's not a silly question. I had exactly the same <laughs> situation, but I didn't have the courage to ask it. Yeah. Um, so that was hugely rewarding, and I believe it was of some benefit. Some people went on to be heads and so on. And, it gave people in this situation they found themselves kind of a set of tools and stuff of they could go back and say to their head, would you mind if I got more involved in finance planning? Right. Could I come along to some governing body committees and get some experience of that? Yeah. So in a sense, we were um, helping people prepare better for headship because yeah. there aren't enough good people going into headship yeah. because it's a risky business. You know, you could come along and you could lose your job, whereas you could stay at deputy head level, be a degree safer, couldn't you? Yeah. And try to encourage a better fields in schools and give people the confidence, because the talent is out there, maybe not as in big numbers as you'd like. We want people to step forward and say, look, headship is really, really enjoyable. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not hard. Yes, there's a lot of work. It's not hard because you'll be in charge and the vision that you have for the organization, your beliefs and so on, you can actually start to put them into, into motion. I mean, it's interesting because to me, you know, you've talked about people who, headship heads who gave people the opportunity. You know, that to me is leadership, recognizing that it's not just about you, but there are a team of people working with you that you need to help develop. So they move on into big heads um, and creating those opportunities. It's also, you just mentioned the word vision. Um, you know, it's having, it, it, it's being able to, to create a, a vision, not just for you, but for the people working with you and for the students at the schools that says, yeah. this is where the school needs to go. This is where we want to take it. Let's try and do this together. And, ha and being able to do that, which is, which is great. So, you, so you've got all these 
potential heads working, you know, and, and becoming heads, or the heads were staying as heads, but, and, but recognizing that perhaps other people needed to be involved. So how did you, but you were still working at Drayton at the same time. So the, that must have been a really difficult, you, you presumably had to depend on the team at Drayton to keep things going when you were also supporting the rest of the, the schooling in London. Yes, I was um, concerned about that because yeah. there's a symbolism to the head in a school. Yeah. Because, you know, you're in more or less daily contact with students and stuff. Whereas yeah. you're a huge organisation, multinational, you're not going to be in daily. You know, if yeah. you're not there, people notice, don't they? Yeah. And for me, the question was, how many days a week can I be out without that becoming an impediment to the progress of school? Yeah. And despite how good your team might be, your senior team in particular, yeah, um, because they're going to have to take the sort of brunt of the work, aren't they, in terms of symbolism? Yeah. What does it feel like to students if they go, oh, well, the head wasn't in school again today? Yeah. What does that do to the, the confidence the community has? In the, is this just some person who's a careerist out to yeah. develop that? Are they really genuinely interested in Drayton and the students? And this is why I think this was 10 years into my career. It wasn't yeah. something I did after two years. I felt that was a sufficient buffer. We did the one day a week first, then two. But it was difficult because yeah. the two days of work you do is actually almost like four days' work. Yes. <laughs> And then the three days you're at school is still like four days. Yeah, exactly. I'm doing eight days. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was hard. I can't say that it was easy, um, but you have to come up with a different way of working and so forth. And you and you're trying to cover an enormous amount of ground as well, aren't you? Yeah. So it's, it's straightforward. But this point, I think, is 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 so well made about the fact that it, it, leadership needs to be seen. Mm. You know, I could imagine, I mean, in a lot of organizations that I work with, you know, people know who the leaders are, but quite often you hear, well, we never see them or yeah. we don't we, we don't get a chance to talk to them in a corridor or yeah. express a viewpoint to them. Yeah. And so your comment about, you know, in a school, it's particularly important that, that the students know that you're about, yeah. or that, 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 that even though you're off doing other things, that you're also there as well. And stop. And staff, and staff, yeah. Uh, I think if you enjoy people's company, and I do, yeah. being visible for me wasn't a difficult thing. Yeah. Um, so when the buzzer went for change of lessons, <clears throat> I, if I could, if I was in the middle of something, I'd always go out. Yeah. Because it was a wonderful way of uh, seeing people. So I'd stand in a particular Busy junction, I was in school, and I say good morning to every student. Yeah. And I'm looking to praise. Yeah. I'm um, equally, of course, you know, I will pick up anything. But as you do it over time, all that stuff diminishes to a very low level. You yeah. tend not to get poor behavior. And you create an atmosphere of warmth, charm, yeah. where even the most timid student will say, Oh, morning, sir, because they're having contact. And I think for Drake Man students, it, it was really enjoyable because we walked out, you have eye contact. We didn't notice the students who joined us from other schools at the same mid-year, looking at the shoes, trying to avoid eye contact. <laughs> <that's it. laughs> they thought I was going to tell them off. And I said, no, it's okay. I'm just saying good morning to you. Nothing yep. more or less. And, you know, those pleasantries, I think, are very important. And then on the back of that, you could have a conversation with a member of staff, let's say the head of a faculty who was walking past, and or a new teacher say, well, how's your first week been? And that's very powerful, isn't it? Yeah. They say, well, I've just got a physics lesson coming up, so I won't keep you, but um, mm. let me know how that lesson went. Yeah. So you're showing an interest in people, yeah. and it just creates a warmth and a sense of belonging, which I think is so important in the school, isn't it? And there's yeah. somebody further up the chain takes an interest in you because you know development and i noticed this when i first went there the people had to not whatever were confusing their own needs the need of the team the need of the school and the need of the education system right and things were getting confused about the priority order 
And in a sense, it's a Venn diagram, isn't it? Yeah. You know, my needs, development needs as an individual have to fit in and mesh with the needs of my chemistry department as a young chemistry teacher, which fits in with the whole school's priorities, yeah. which fits in with the national priorities that the government set up for whatever the priority of the day was. Yeah. And I think if you're trying to give too much prominence to one or the other, you can end up distorting the system. Yeah. And that way, I think if you explain things clearly to people, you say, we're not neglecting your development, but this is where it sits in the development of you, your department, the school, and that. And people say, oh, right, okay, I get that now. Yes. You yeah. know, okay, so that's going to be six months' time. So, yeah, that's what's, yeah. and the people are happy. Yeah. So I think that, that presence allows you to explain stuff in a language and create a language. Because the other thing I noticed at the school I went to, it wasn't a school that eased with itself. And when I spoke to staff and started briefing, I'd use the language of, of, of you know, I'd, I'd almost kind of work in of how I would tell a child how to behave if I was do something that wasn't of the necessary standard. Yeah. And then a week later, I heard people saying, using the same expression in the corridor. Right. Yeah. So it changed from shouting at a student, take your coat off, yeah. to... Do you know why, you know, we don't allow coats to be worn in the corridor? Yeah. Oh, actually, no one's ever explained that to me. Well, the reason is, and the, it just changed the whole atmosphere because yeah. suddenly you're treating people in a more adult way. You know, young people want to be treated as adults. Yeah. The adults had, a, had an opportunity to show their adulthood. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it yeah. just becomes a more mature, forgiving environment where... Everyone makes mistakes, and the point is, you're not going to get crucified, you know, unless you do something really terrible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not going to get crucified for mistakes, and so therefore, you get a more creative culture. But there has to be a discipline with that that you need to understand what responsibilities you then have, because yeah. your needs are really part of a huge set of needs. Yeah. of the school, the country, and so on. So where does that come? Um, and I think if you give people a chance to get involved in that way, they feel they've had a say. I remember coming down from a staff meeting once and explaining a change to a particular system that the school needed, which would help, yeah. well, in old-fashioned terms, both the pastoral work and the academic output of the yeah. business. Yeah. <laughs> And it was challenging for some staff and I explained it. They thought, well, that's well thought through. And I always give people some models. And I said, well, we could stay exactly as we are, but you know, you've, you've told me it doesn't work. Yeah. Here's a model, and here's another more extreme model, and then let's talk about that. And then coming down the corridor, and a member of staff who hadn't always been the most supportive, she said to me, thank you for involving us in the running of the school. Yeah. And it wasn't a particularly senior member of staff, but she was a bit of a cynic. Um, and I thought, well, that's good, isn't it? Because now she's thinking actively about what she can do to influence the school. Yeah. She might not get everything she wants. Yes. Who does? Yes. yes. But she's helped shape the school's future. Yeah. And I think that's so powerful, then, isn't it? If, if the students and staff feel they're shaping the future, you can't get anything you want, but together we're better going forward. Yeah. And I think visibility, coming back to your original question, really helps with that. Yeah. Because then you can fine-tune people's perceptions. So often I'd be in the corridor, I'd stroll up to a member of staff on duty. I said, uh, have you had a chance to read the paper on the curriculum reform? Oh, yeah, yeah, I have. I just, what do you think of it? You know, just between you and me. He said, well, actually, it's all first page. But secondly, it's a bit complicated. To do it. And then, so that, I said, oh, thanks for that. Yeah. I let my deputy know I was leaving that working party. Yeah. So you're not trying to bypass the process. You know, there's a formal process yeah. that's taking place in consultation, but you're supplementing it. Yeah. So if you were you know, sitting as you are now, having got all of this experience, <laughs> if I was sitting opposite you and I was saying, Pritpal, um, I've got an opportunity to move into a leadership role in a school. I've, I've never been in a leadership role before. I've, I've been a teacher, but I haven't necessarily been head of a department or a deputy head. What might be a couple of bits of advice that you would give me based on all your experience? I'm saying, you know, Pritpal, a couple of things I ought to pay attention to from a leadership point of view. 
what would what advice would that be? What would you be telling me to watch out for or to pay attention to? I think preparation. Yep. Um, sometimes, you know, when you're applying for a higher post, and I find myself in that situation where I was a head of science looking to be a deputy, and there was no one really I could turn to for advice about what preparation did I need to do to be a deputy head. Right. I had to kind of do it on my own. Yeah. And look for help. In some organizations, you have people, you can have those conversations with country. Yeah. who will say, you need to, you know, really think about, you know, this bit of leadership or that bit of the curriculum or legislation. Yeah. You know, have you read the latest document on the national curriculum, for example? Or yeah. I hadn't thought of that. You will get asked a question on that in your interview. Yeah. So there's that sort of preparation. But I think the most important thing is emotional preparation. You know, being a leader, it's not a lonely job. I never found it lonely. Uh, but I think I enjoy the people of companies why I stay in the job so long. Yeah. But you are responsible for the decisions. That's the, one of the first things I explained to staff who were kind of a bit confused about decision making. I said, I'll, take your, I'll listen to you for your advice. There will be formal systems where you will be able to put it around, and then I will decide. Yeah. And then they looked at me like this is a dictator. I said, the reason I'll take the decision is I will protect you if anything goes wrong. Yeah. I will take full responsibility because at the end of the day, I'm not going to turn around if, let's say, the new behavior policy is a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> and I chose that one out of the six that we had. I'm not going to blame you. And you can see the sign of relief. Yeah. Here is somebody who... So I think that emotional preparation, are you prepared to be responsible Everything that not just goes right in the school, yeah, for what goes wrong in the school, yeah. Are you able to live with a lot of decisions for which there's no clear cut answer, yeah, or solution? You make your best decision based on your research, and then you have to, you have to wait five, 10, 15 years to find out if that's correct. Can you sleep at night? Yeah. When people are knocking on your door and say, this new initiative isn't working, and you say, give it another nine years. <laughs> you know, yeah. I was like, are you able to do that? So I think for me, emotional stuff, because if you haven't got that emotional strength, I think you as a leader will struggle. Yeah. Um, I think that's all. Now, then on top of that, of course, you need to equip yourself with all the kind of um, intellectual, stuff that you need and i think there no one can ever know everything so surround yourself with the best people are you somebody who's prepared to have people on your team more clever than you yeah. <laughs> and not feel threatened by that yes <laughs> so th those are two bits of advice i would give personally yeah. Yeah. get your emotional strength right because yeah. if you crumble and everything that's going to, that's going to, and things are going to happen. Yeah. And, and my advice on that is, how will you know if you have emotional strength? Well, we don't go looking for trouble. Things will go wrong. And some very, very bad things will, go, will happen. Mm. What, what, what is the test? Well, that's your moment to shine, isn't it? Yeah. That's your moment to shine. Not to complain. Go and hide in your office. Yes. That's your moment to shine. Yeah. <laughs> Shining can be done in different ways. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be just you at the top with a beak and done it before. So I don't know if that helps with anything. That's the two bits of yeah. emotional. I, I love it. So so and being visible, yeah, preparing, because at the end of the day you've got to live with the decisions you make. Um, having the emotional strength to be able to bear to live with situations where there is no simple solution. You've just got to deal with it and, and hope that you've made the right choice. And yeah, and, and, and I, I like that final bit about saying it's not just about you, it's about surrounding yourself with, with people who ultimately are even brighter and better at doing it than you are. I mean, I, I made a comment once to a group of guys, I said, your job as a leader is to make yourself redundant. And there was a horrible sort of intake of breath at that point. And I said, what I really need to say is that you're surrounding yourself by people, you know, who are better than you. And if you've done that, then great, because instead of one prick pulsing, yeah. there are 20 
other types of prim pulsing taking on school work. I think that's right. And also not cloning people. You know? Yes. And if you, if you yeah. said to me, one of three things, I would say, don't worry. You, you know, everyone's different. Everyone brings their own life experiences because that's what they have. Yeah. You, you know, we spend a lot of time together in our school days, but we have very different backgrounds and life experiences. Yeah. But we're still very close. Yeah. I don't expect you to be like you know, you know, and the vice versa. But and you bring those along with you in your professional life to help you make things, illuminate things for students and staff. So if you're a team leader in school, you use your life to deliver it, but not to the exclusion of other um, examples. So I can talk about Kekule, about organic chemistry. I can talk about you know Mendeley and the periodic table because that's the discipline I'm a chemist. But I can also add to that with my own life experiences so to give a context and, and so on. Um, and that, if you have that, plus the discipline, I keep going on about this, the discipline of knowing that the organisation has to, in a sense, come first. Yeah. Drayton Manor must exist for decades and decades and decades, otherwise we won't be serving the community. Yeah. Me and other heads will come and go, other teachers will come and go, students will come and go. The school has to continue, you know, otherwise a total disservice, isn't it? Yeah. To all that went along. So I think having that discipline to keep that organizational view of the, the decade-long, century-long progress of that school to move forward with all the challenges, you know, mm. things have gone second world war and all the rest of it. But at the same time, not trying to clone people is very important. So giving people enough scope to be themselves, but those people having the sense and judgment to know we're not to stray too far beyond it. Yeah. And make it too, because then it gets too personal. Yeah. And it's all about you then, isn't it? That's yeah. not very interesting. <laughs> you know, not you, but, you know, <laughs> that, you know. And so that also gives students and staff the confidence to talk about more of themselves. I was standing in the, in, the, in the playground, and this boy is always late to school. He's late again, and normally I'll just get the head of year or yeah. two. But on the tenth time, I called him. I can't remember his name. Um, called him Mike. I said, Mike, you're late. I think it's four times this week. He said, Look, I'm really sorry. So I said, Thank you for apologising, but that's not the reason. I want to know the reason. He said, well, I've got a paper around. I said, Well. You know what time school starts. You need to start earlier. Well, I, I can't. I said, okay, give me a reason. He said, because there's some complicated story about his mum couldn't take the younger son to primary school. There was, some, yeah. there was a reason why, and they were short of money. So he needed the paper out. Yeah. He needed to fulfill his domestic role, but he's late for school. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, right. Uh, Go and speak to your head of year about that. I'll have a chat with Mr. or Mrs. Let's kind of work out a solution. You can't be there at school, but I'm sure we can help. I mean, maybe we can have a word with the news agent. And yeah. so we were able to resolve it. Yeah. And that again came through. Again, that interest for other people. Yeah. Finding out a little bit about them. And the boy had the confidence to tell me the real reason because he could have buttoned himself up, couldn't he? Yeah, it just fought me off with some yeah. story, but and then it got better. It wasn't perfect. <laughs> it got, got better. better. <laughs> yeah. Pripa, I, I think we we'll probably have to call it there for the day, but it's, it's been great. And thank you so much for sharing your views. We must continue this conversation on into the future, I think, because I just, I just sense we've just scratched the surface. So I haven't put you off, mate. No, no, you haven't put me off. That's, that's been great. Thank you so much.